I lived in Berlin, and I tell you, the Berlin Wall was a nice place compared to the Israeli wall that they're building now. And it's not built on the border, it's built on Palestinian land, and it's a series of walls. It's not one wall. The only power in Israel are the security services. And that is not a healthy state. You cannot travel because there are checkpoints everywhere. I get strip searched every time I go in and out of the country, which is usually twice or three times a month. Recently, they uh, have been cracking down, as they say, and have been denying hundreds, no, it's actually thousands of people, they've been denying them entry back into the country. Uh, now, these are people who are married to people who have either Palestinian citizenship or Israeli citizenship. Um, they've been living for years and years here, and they've been divided from their families. My father's family come from a village that used to be uh, 10 kilometers to the east of Tel Aviv. They fled in 1948 after the establishment of the State of Israel uh, during what Israel calls the War of Independence and we Palestinian call as our catastrophe. And they fled under fire. My father's family moved into the Ramallah region where my father later on uh, met my mother and married. So this became their first uh, step in exile. But then in the early 60s, my father took the family out of the country. We were, he took us to Saudi Arabia for uh, economic reasons. He found a job there. And in 1967, the, uh, Israel occupied the rest of uh, historical Palestine or what became known as the West Bank, and we were not allowed to return. Uh, so we became exiled again from our exile into another exile, and we ended up having to immigrate. We ended up having to go to the United States. I've been living in the West Bank, the Palestinian ter territory, since 94. On August 3rd, 2005, I was flying, I flew into Ben Gurion Airport. For some reason, the immigration department would not allow me in for the first time, and I was not given a reason why. So I was detained in a jail cell, and all my personal belongings were taken, and my mobile, and I was made to leave the next day. So I went to Jordan. And uh, I came in through the Jordan crossing point, Allenby Bridge, and I was given a month. After the month expired, I tried to renew, but I was denied. So having the responsibilities that I have, my ailing mother, all the responsibilities of the school, I chose to violate and overstay my visa in the hopes of trying to find means of staying. And I haven't been able to. One by one, we started hearing from our friends that they exited and they weren't coming back. And we basically put the pieces together to learn alone, because this is not an announced policy from the Israeli side, that this is a new policy that's being implemented of, of forcing internationals, whether they're Palestinians who hold foreign passports or internationals that are non-Palestinian, uh, Israel is prohibiting them from entering or re-entering uh, the Palestinian ter territory. The information regarding Israel is totally controlled and, and carefully presented. Israel has total control of the crossing points here. The way you can enter the West Bank is either through the uh, crossing point at the Allenby Bridge with Jordan or through uh, uh, crossing points with Israel uh, proper, if you will. And to enter Israel, you enter it through the airport. So that's how they control entry into the West Bank, into the occupied territory. An occupying authority, which Israel is recognized as such in the West Bank, has the obligation to allow free entry into the area. But they totally control the entry. It's bureaucratic evil. The Israeli system of occupation, or system towards 
Arabs and Israel mm -hmm. is an evil system. People are not evil, but the system is. I was stopped at the airport and interrogated by who I assumed to be the secret police. When they started asking about how many children do I have, and I say, I have three children, two have um, German passports and one has an Israeli passport, and the man told me, he says, no you don't, you only have two kids. And I say, excuse me, but I have three kids. And he says, no, you only have two. That's not your daughter. <laughs> Going through your head, you're wondering, what do you answer? And I just thought, I'm not even going to dignify that lowly, bureaucratic, secret policeman with an answer. Where, therefore, they inform me after a number of hours of interrogation that I would be given a, a visa for one week, and then I would be considered persona non grata, and I would have to leave, and I would be denied it. I had to leave the country. What's it like living in Cairo? Well, um, I'm physically here, but, tech, but uh, <laughs> emotionally, I'm still not here. And the situation we're in is, is tearing my family apart in every way. I had to tell the kids, look, Baba can't come back now. I didn't tell them first why, because I, th I was afraid, you know, that they, you know, they get nightmares from stuff like that. How long? Do I have to live without my wife and kids? How long do they have to live without me? And my daughter kept asking, is Baba going to be back on my birthday? Which was then like five months away, uh, two months away, sorry. And I was like, yeah, sure, of course he's going to come, you know. <laughs> Our daughter is very emotional. She cried and she said, what do you mean? He's never coming back or whatever. And I said, look, the lawyer is helping us. And so, you know, and I guess it made it, for them, it made it a bit easier, even though it's hard to understand. As I see it, the officers don't want Akram and people like Akram to enter the system. Because once you are into the system, you get what you uh, deserve by law. He's not connected to any terror organization. He never made any crime. So he's very clean, a very decent person. He works for his living. He can support his family. There's no reason for no letting him to uh, Israel. It has nothing to do with legality. It has nothing to do with security. It has everything to do with destroying any hope of a peaceful solution. That's what it's about and emptying Palestine of Palestinians. This is why I overstayed my visa. I, I can't leave my mother. She is a precious, precious person. Last year, when they, in the airport, they don't want to give her a visa, and I become cry and jump, and how, Hanan, where she can go? And my daughter, the oldest one, said, 
calm down, wait. Inshallah, then she come for a month, and the month is finished. And Israeli, they don't care with many like Hanan. To be denied the, the ability to live here is like having my existence torn out of me. I don't know what else I, I could do, or what else would I be? I don't know. I mean, it's an existential crisis for me right now. It is. I'm, I'm at a loss. I'm a US citizen. I could go live in America. People are dying to go to America. I'm a, I have a Jordanian passport. I could live in Jordan. But I feel so foreign. I think it, for the first time, I feel as though I'm being evicted out of the earth. This school has uh, helped the, the, the return of Palestinian Americans wishing to uh, reacculture themselves uh, in the local society. And also it brings in people with capital, with money. I have been again coming back and forth for the past 10 years, probably three times, four times a year. For the past two years, I have uh, been involved in the uh, development of the uh, Palestinian medical school. The campus of the university now has been placed outside the Jerusalem area through the recently erected wall. So we're on the West Bank side of the wall now. Because the university is outside now, they uh, have passed the responsibility for visas to the Palestinian Authority. But there is no liaison now between Palestinian Authority and the Israeli government. Uh, so they will not issue a work visa. So uh, on my recent uh, attempts at entry, I was threatened um, that I would not be allowed in. I managed to come in finally through the help of the Israeli chapter of the Physicians for Human Rights, uh, who um, um, engaged a lawyer on my behalf, and the lawyer managed to get a permission for me to enter the occupied territories from the uh, uh, military authorities. But I'm not sure whether I'd be able to use that on the following uh, uh, visit. So it's the, the issue remains. It's, rand it's random and it's um, unpredictable. Uh, so there's always an anxiety. I was requested by some uh, Palestinian investors to become a project manager for the Plaza Shopping Center, which is the first modern retail shopping center in Palestine. It has been a very successful project business-wise, uh, and it's a $10 million project and hires around 220 people directly and probably about 500 in, uh, indirect hires uh, uh, as well. So the project was uh, another landmark project uh, that I feel I contributed to in a very significant way. Uh, by being here. We, as the business sector, are fully engaged in ending the occupation. Israel should have no doubt about it. There is no backroom deal that can happen with the business community that will allow occupation to exist. However, there are many opportunities for the Israelis to open doors, open windows, allow access to happen, that while we're ending this occupation, we can start rehabilitating the two peoples together. What's happening today is just the opposite. Every single door, window, opportunity that the Israelis have to, to lend a hand to those people that they have almost destroyed completely, they are closing it. So I would urge the Israeli community to look deeper into their policies and to see that if you take the Sam Bahors out of this community, if you take the international expertise out of this community, what you, be, what you will be left with are those 10-year-old Palestinians that today jump on the back of an armored tank. In 20 years, God only knows what they will do. There was no money. We did not develop our streets, our education system, our health system. The one who was running us is the Israeli officers, okay? They put uh, a head at the education system. Uh, they call them uh, an education general. He's the only one running the system, and everybody is Palestinian. And a general at the top of the health department, and he's the only Israeli, and the others are Palestinians. So we did not develop our systems over here, our streets, our water, our electricity.
as long as the Palestinians don't have anything to guard, fighting and firing randomly will be easy. But when you create institutions that create jobs and create or help develop the economy, the economy and culture also, it creates a, a social peace that from which a larger peace can be created. Now, the word peace, I use it here very carefully because Palestinians are not necessarily comfortable with that word because it's so politicized and so it's almost hijacked by, I think, Western uh, nations that want a certain kind of peace. Nobody's against peace, but it's between quotes. Peace has been translated as uh, succumbing to you know, others or Western um, portrayal or image of peace for the Palestinians. From day one, we've seen that the donor involvement has been on the sidelines, trying to affect policy, trying to implement foreign agendas uh, by way of NGOs or otherwise. And what has happened is that a lot of money was spent here, probably more humanitarian and assist technical assistance money was put into Palestine than probably anywhere in the world during this period of time. But what's there to show for it? Not much. Israel's subjective point of view. We have no interest living this next to a failed society, to a, next to a failed economy, next to a failed political structure on the contrary. We'd like to have a good neighbor, a more, a more successful neighbor, a, more, um, a neighbor with a more a strong democracy. That's good for Israel too. We're talking about three and a half million Palestinians living near subsistence level. And it's not the tradition of Palestinians to depend on charity. But in a repressive situation as they are in now, with excessive controls and almost an unprecedented internationally, they have no choice but to depend on external assistance. When the occupation uh, was imposed on Palestine in 67, the ratio of per capita income in Israel and per capita income in Palestine was 7 to 1. Now it is nearly 30 to 1. The occupation has done us absolutely no good. sad that my kids have to go through this and this is bad for Israel and it's bad it's not in the interest of my government the United States government what they're doing and I would expect my government to do more to have their citizens treated better and I mean, I'm I mean, at the Central Bank of Egypt, I mean, I'm a USA contractor. So, uh, but the fact is that, unfortunately, not all citizens are created equal. I'm just excited to see my family again. And for the past 10 weeks, I've seen them for a day. My kids have a right to see their father. I never thought I'd have to choose between my country and my, my kids. 
Ich liebe Baba. Wow. And you were not there. That's what you wrote. I missed you. I missed you too. Wow. Very much. You really wrote that. I missed you too. I slide down quicker with a pillow. You want to go eat pizza? What? You want to go eat pizza? I can't. I'll get nauseous. My dad is from the Galilee, from Marami, and he went as a 19-year-old student to Germany to study, and he met my mom. I was raised in Germany, and then when I was like 19, I thought, okay, I'll go come here for half a year and study Arabic. I ended up in uh, Jerusalem first, and then somehow I met somebody, and she said I can live with her in Ramallah. We actually met in a cab. <laughs> Did you? <laughs> yeah, we did, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Going, yeah. We One of those, uh, what do you call them? Service yeah. taxis, where it goes from point A to point B, and you get, you know, seven people in the car. And then they just, that's how we met. Can get in, can get out, wherever you want, you know. And I didn't know, I wanted to get out somewhere to bring a gift to a person, and a refugee camp, a woman. And I didn't know where it was exactly. So I heard him speaking English with, with some girl, you know. So I asked him, oh, could you please help me and tell me where is Kalandia, you know. And he's like, yeah, sure, of course, you know, I'll show you. And that was our first meeting. And, uh, you know, I got out of the cab. I thought, nice guy. But that was it. <laughs> Two weeks later, he showed up at uh, my friend's house. And he's like, you were in that cab. And I was like, I don't really remember you. <laughs> my ego went. <laughs> Very quickly. <laughs> All right, it is overinflated anyway, but. <laughs> We got married on, at the Sharia court, at the religious court. We took our marriage certificate to the U.S. consulate where they you know, notarized it and recognized it. It was kind of like reception because it was intifada time, you know, and people didn't dance, which we were lucky back then. Thank <laughs> we God. thought, oh, thank God, you know, we didn't have to Weddings dance. Weddings were very low-key yeah. at that it time. It was kind of like a reception and, you know, everybody getting together and... And eating and taking pictures. Yeah, <laughs> so exactly. Three hours of <laughs> yeah. eating and taking pictures. We didn't have an intention to going to Germany at first. When we left, we said we were only going to go for like two, three, four years and then come back here. But in the end, we stayed nine years. We always had this, you know, thing in the back of our heads, you know, that one day, if there's an opportunity, we'll come back. And one day it just happened, you know, because Akram got a job offer. And then we decided, well, great, this is the opportunity to do it. Emotionally and psychologically, we, had, we were ready to come back. is crying and I look you know over, over the hills or whatever it's like there's something that's very it's like my childhood dreams come true in a way I'm very hooked to this place there's something about it I can't even tell you exactly what it is but there's something you know maybe I, I got this feeling from my father who was telling stories about how he grew up and 
And uh, I mean, people are very nice. It's the society is very much, you know, it's different than Germany. I mean, Germany has its other um, opportunities or whatever advantages, you know. But um, here, people are very close knit. You know, people smile, people say hello when you talk to them, you know, they're very sweet with kids, even the men are very sweet with kids, you know. And uh, and the kids feel felt that too, and I think they, they were very comfortable living here, they are very comfortable living here. But also when they moved, you know, it was very nice for them to having their family around also, and uh, yeah, I mean, for me it was the right decision, definitely. We wanted them to go to the Friends School, which is a Quaker school. It's where my father went to school, it's where I went to school, and now it's where our kids are going to school. It's a wonderful 150-year-old uh, Quaker institution in Ramallah. One of our values, our school values, is nonviolence. And, and therefore, we stress the issue of nonviolence. So we're challenged by our students when we talk about nonviolence. When they see the, their, their town bombed and their relatives killed, uh, they, they challenge us and they come and say, you know, how can we be um, supporters of nonviolence when all of this is happening? And we engage in long dialogue with our students and we teach conflict resolution. We, we um, share with them examples from around the world. And so this is something that um, we're proud of, um, that we, we provide the sort of the, the alternative to them that there are ways of resolving conflict non-violently. Um, but at the same time, we allow them the space to express anger, because uh, you can't suppress that. The Palestinians were able to meet the challenge the international community put upon them by holding democratic elections for the Palestinian parliament. These are elections that Jimmy Carter and a whole series of officials, uh, John Kerry, who is a presidential candidate in the States, was at my polling booth here in Albida when I went to vote, uh, and he was checking the, uh, the ballot boxes to make sure they were correct. I kind of think he should have been in Ohio checking the ballot boxes there, but that's a different story. When the international community started to penalize the Palestinians because the results of the elections that they supported did not end up as they were expecting, what they have done is given several lessons or several messages to the Palestinian community. One, it's democracy is okay as long as the results are as we, as we wish. And for the first time going through a democratic process, that's a very wrong lesson to be able to give to a community coming out of a, a humanitarian crisis and a political crisis. جاءت نتائج الانتخابات في اليوم التالي مباشرة بدأ الحصار هذا كلام ضد الديمقراطية لا يعقل أن تقبل بالديمقراطية ولا تقبل بنتائجها هذا يعني أنك لا تقبل الديمقراطية وهذا كلام عجيب وغير معقول خاصة من أوروبا التي تتربع على الديمقراطية وتصدر الديمقراطية ما دامت أوروبا تريد أن تصدر الديمقراطية وأمريكا تريد أن تصدر الديمقراطية وما دامت إسرائيل تقول أنها تريد ديمقراطية هذه نتائج الديمقراطية علينا جميعا أن نحترم نتائج الديمقراطية ونقدر تضحياتكم في سبيل الحرية والكرامة لسون بين زملائكم النواب لتمثيل شعبكم الذي اختاركم لي At the moment it's very very difficult because unfortunately since the Palestinians received full control of Gaza you've had the Hamas victory you've had daily rocket launches from Gaza to Israeli civilian communities trying to kill Israeli civilians and, and, and the question has to be asked, yes? Uh, what basis is there of a peace process when the Palestinian society, unfortunately today, is so dysfunctional? We don't have a Phantom or F-16 or the Qadifat or the Nuevos. We are the ones who put the weapons in the streets, in Haifa, Tel Aviv, and Tel Aviv. The Palestinians are human, like the people of the world. They are human. من استمرار إسرائيل بخرق التالي
the war on terror is just one of these buzzwords that will simply shut up everybody. You know, everybody would love to join in because it sounds like, you know, we are the good guys. We are doing um, something that will save the world from total destruction. The reality is that, you know, the most dangerous, um, I don't know, state, um, maybe worldwide, but uh, uh, certainly in the area here is Israel because it really stirs up lots of opposition from the Arab world. See, this used to be the main road to Jerusalem, and now they divided it. This was the coming and that going on the other side. Now they divided it by the wall. They divided the two-lane road, or the two-side road, into two roads. And this area used to be so commercially Popular. active, right. yeah, and now it's dead, essentially. Nobody it comes. looks like, you know, the Israeli government uh, would want to um, um, uh, achieve a kind of an Arab free zone. So the, the occupation is just a means. I mean, um, it's a good one, you know, because it's a kind of genocide that doesn't get across as one. And uh, with the rhetorics of, you know, peace-seeking, um, I don't know, governments, we um, destroy almost everything. I had to go to Gaza for a day, and trying to leave Gaza was, was very difficult. We came under Israeli tank fire for three hours. Now, the next day, we'd been in touch with the U.S. Embassy and the U.S. Consulate, and there was an arrangement for an evacuation of all American citizens out of Gaza. And while I was speaking with someone at the U.S. Consulate in Jerusalem, and she was taking my, my passport data and my, uh, the number and my birth date and so forth, and then my last name is Baker. It's written Baker in English. And she said, what's your first name? And I said, Akram, and she was quiet. And I said, what's the problem? She says, I hate to ask you this, but are you of ethnic Palestinian origin? And my response was, isn't that illegal for you to ask me that? Does this matter? No, it's not us, it's the Israelis, was her response. And I said, since when does my government play or discriminate by proxy for the Israeli military authorities? I don't get it. I'm an American. I'm telling you, I need your help. I was under tank fire for three hours. I need to get out of here. And where, then she started telling me, don't you be rude, don't you raise your voice. We are not going to help you. I met Akram about half a year ago. I really liked him personally. And uh, I really want to help him because he has his family here, his wife and children. And um, his status is unrecognized. He was uh, struggling for about uh, three years trying to register his children here in Israel as Israeli citizens because her mother is Israeli. And uh, he just couldn't do it. When our daughter was born, and then we, got, then we went to go get her papers uh, at some point to get her, her um, an Israeli passport, her birth certificate. And uh, so we went to the Ministry of Interior. This is the birth certificate. Look, very interesting. Akram's name is not appearing. There's no father for the child. How could that happen? So then the woman took the birth certificate and scratched and changed her name from Baker to uh, Amal's maiden name, to Helu put that she's Christian, and under father, scratched out and put unknown. This is not a way to handle uh, such uh, requests. I mean, as long as the law is this way, they should act according to the law. I mean, we even have proof that we're living together. We have two kids that have his last name, and she just wouldn't, you know, wouldn't listen to that. She just put unknown. It's I mean, like the I mean, name was there, you know. She could at least put that in. They don't need any DNA test or anything. They just yeah, look exactly. at the teeth and they know it's, you know, they're my exactly. kids. It's just silliness. It's not silliness, it's, it's viciousness.
my wife has Israeli citizenship. And when we applied for residency in Israel, they said, oh, you can't do it because we don't recognize mixed marriages. They made some problems because you're not born in Israel and you're not Jewish. And she said, it doesn't matter. Do we have second class citizens here? And the woman was very clear at the Ministry of Interior. She said, you're not a Jew. If you were a Jew, you would get it. If you're married to a Israeli citizen, you ask for uh, leave to stay. You can stay here for a few years, and later on you become an uh, Israeli citizen. This is actually what Akram wants to do. You can't get Israeli citizenship or, or leave to stay just because you are married to an Israeli citizen if you are Palestinian. Akram is not a Palestinian. He has a Palestinian heritage because his sources are from uh, from Bethlehem, I think, from somewhere like, uh, from Bethlehem. But he is not a Palestinian. He was born in the United States. He lived most of his life in Germany. So he's, he's not a Palestinian. It's like the essential right of a family to be together. And they told the lawyer, well, we're not all keeping them apart. She can leave. You know, how disgusting. He didn't do anything wrong or whatever. And, you know, we were just making a living like everybody else. It's like, uh, no, no way, you know. We'll go through that, but no way are we going to leave. Why not for that? I find it outrageous as a, I mean, for Israel to claim that it's the only, democrat, only democracy in the Middle East is, and you can bleep this out, but that's a crock of shit. This is not a democracy. Israel is not a democracy. It's a, a democracy for Jews as South Africa was a democracy for whites. That's all it is. And they can claim whatever they want and if, you know, they can have President Bush claim that it's the only democracy and, and, and do all of this, but it, it's not. When I was on the airport, when I was denied entry and the immigration uh, officials, which are always the meanest, immigration people are from another planet. I don't know how they find them. And the women were so mean. And yet I was, cr and I said, I, I cried so incessantly and I was heaving and everybody was looking at me and an Israeli police woman came and hugged me and kissed me and said, if I could, I would let you in. I felt guilty to accept her affection because she's a police officer, oh my God. But on a human level, I understood that she, and she felt my pain, and as a woman, and all that. And I felt good deep down, although I felt guilty, but something inside of me was very comforted and pleased for just a few moments. And so in the end, there are moments like that that you feel that, no, your police officer came and hugged me and kissed me. So there are humans amongst you. I remember once they, you know, I came at, at a checkpoint. It was at 7 p.m. and there were a couple of soldiers, you know, bored at night chatting. And I was the only one waiting at the checkpoint. And they just kept me waiting in my car for no reason. And I had a book with me and I just kept reading. And, you know, they didn't like it that I was just reading and I'm not too disturbed by it. And he said, well, you know, after a while, he said, we kept you for half an hour. You're not upset. I said, what can I do? I have a book and you have a gun. So I read my book and you have your gun. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so I, you just deal with it. There are some about 500 barriers. By barriers, I mean it could be a gate. Some, some villages have gates that completely close. Uh, it could be concrete blocks. It could be heaps of, of rubble and, and earth. And it could be manned uh, checkpoints. There are about 80 some manned checkpoints, not between the West Bank and Israel, but also within segments of the West Bank, controlling the flow from north to south, essentially dividing it into three major groups.
there has to be contact, and because contact and human interaction diminishes fear, it creates familiarity, it shows people that they are all the same. It's just about simple, basic rights. I want to be able to enter and leave as I please, when I please. I can't. And it's, it's that. It's not about who's ruling the Palestinians, Fatah or Hamas, or who cares. I think I want the same rights that the Israelis have. And you know what? And I'm about to explode because I'm not getting them. She's not alone, obviously, as I'm sure you've heard, there are some 60,000 people. Um, these are some estimates, there are no accurate figures of people who are uh, 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 sort of uh, imprisoned here because they cannot leave. And they risk if they leave that they won't be allowed to come back here again. And for various reasons, they cannot, not, they cannot uh, risk not being allowed in. Palestinians are not allowed to go to Israel anymore. So they're really enclosed, they're, they're encircled. They can't leave their cities, so they don't have access to talk or to see Israelis. The new generation that's been growing up for the past 10 years, they only really see soldiers. Whereas before that, at least, you know, they could go to the beaches and they could go to Haifa, to Akko, whatever, and spend the day. special to me. It's like a way of getting out, and I know a lot of people can't do that. When I come here, it's like you have, you have the feeling the conflict is really far away. You don't feel this tension that you feel in Jerusalem or in Ramallah. It's like... It's just very different than from the stress that you feel because of the checkpoints and everything. You don't have that here. People just move, you know. They get out in the morning, they go to work, they go to school, and then they come back in the afternoon. It's just normal. I mean, when I tell people that I come here, you know, they say, oh, wow, we haven't been there in 10, 12 years, you know. horrible experiences to be deported and away from my family for, for two months. And this appeal, which they let me back in for 30 days. And then, as you said, you're very uncomfortable with the ruling. Why would they do that? Is there a precedent for this? I mean, why, why would they do this? I have zero faith in the Israeli justice system right now. I have zero faith in the government system. Well, I have two things to, to tell you. One is that you are invited to the 18th of December to the Home Office, and there you will be also asked to fill the questionnaire and to provide all documents, and hopefully the process will start. I don't know what's going to happen. Maybe they will extend it for extra 30 days, 40 days, 50 days, I don't know how much. And uh, hopefully, in the end, you'll get, uh, is, uh, you get a leave to stay. But the judge says that you, you'll get only one permit to enter to Israel. And you'll get this permission only once to arrange your status. And you will not have another opportunity. But the question is why, Your Honor. Why? I think we, we have why, to ask ourselves why? why. Why are they doing this? 
As, okay. as you said, okay. I have no criminal record. Okay. I have okay. no okay. negative okay. security now, now record. We're, now I'm we're very going transparent. Back. Now, we're going, now back, we're going back to what you said, that you have no uh, faith in the Israeli system. I have, I think, I, yeah, okay. I have the right to th I okay, feel okay, this. Okay, okay, okay. I, I also want to... I have faith in you, but I don't I, have faith I, I, in this system. This is, Why this, is the system doing this Well, uh, look, I have a great faith in the Israeli judicial uh, system. I think it's one of the greatest in, uh, in the world. It's really a very, very good one. We have very good judges, but the system is not one system. We have the judicial system. We have the officers working and we have the government. It's, it's the civil service, it's the government, and it's the judicial system. And they don't have the same policy all the time. Israel understands that a lot of these people with foreign passports are actually a very positive influence on Palestinian society. They tend to be more uh, liberal, more democratic, more um, uh, bringing in economic uh, uh, resources and so forth. We have every interest in them being there. We have every interest in them helping to build the Palestinian economy, to build Palestinian society, to strengthen uh, uh, political institutions on the Palestinian side. Just a moment, I'll let you know when. I made this, uh, this application to court on, on the 25th of June. Maybe on the 18th of December, some officer in the Home Office would look at his documents. Maybe. They could finish his case within this half a year if they really wanted to. But nobody is really interested in doing it quickly. The officers in the Home Office don't want minorities to become Israeli citizens. They want to keep Israel as homogeneous as possible. This is their policy. It's not written anywhere. But this is how they behave. They can't act against the law, but they can make your life very, very hard. We have another appointment on the 28th where we have to bring the, the form and bring uh, 1,000 papers. So, so what does that mean? Yeah. And then means I have a stay of execution until yeah. the 28th. So you're allowed to stay until the 28th? 28th, yeah. He yeah. Said, and I said, yeah, on the 26th. He says, no, you have to leave on the 25th. And he, so on the 28th, if we uh, hand in the application. Well, I said, um, well, I get. Are you going to give me that? Oh, we'll have to talk to the court. I think it'll be fine. Get it! You want to give me a lot of it. The shy I can't plan anything because it's not based in law. That's the problem. It's, it's illegal what they're doing. So the fact is that when none of this is based on published criteria, which is open to everyone, where you can see what you need to do, then there are, this threat is always being held over, over your head. And uh, in my profession, I just can't do that anymore. I just can't do that. We're not terrorists. We're not fighting the state of Israel. We're not denying any Israeli any right. We're not going and bombing uh, anyone or setting up any sort of, you know, uh, I mean, we're just trying to live with each other legally uh, on, on our ancestral homeland with my mother who has no one. Why does it reach people like us who could be forwarding the cause of peace? Yes, I do want it, but I'm given no, nothing tangible to work with. I, I'm not even legal. I'm a ghost here. Ghost from her city, from her yeah. country. In my, in my homeland, I'm, I'm a ghost. Yeah. No, but I mean, do Israelis want to work with Palestinians who want peace? OK, how? I don't know. I'm really, I'm really asking, because I'm lost.
the law of return, which was legislated with the birth of the State of Israel, was to give an automatic right to citizenship to Jews everywhere. The state was created after the Holocaust, and not just the Holocaust, after thousands of years of persecution of Jews in all corners of the world. And the idea was that this has to be a refuge for Jews. And indeed, that was the Balfour Declaration, and that was uh, agreed by the United Nations, that this would be a refuge for Jews. Um, and so the law of return did give that preference for the return of Jews who could demand automatic citizenship in the state of Israel. That does not mean that nobody else can get citizenship in the state of Israel, but they don't get the automatic citizenship that is given to Jews. כל יישוב במדינת ישראל ובשטחים צריכים החלטת ממשלה על הקמתו. מה, אם יושב יישוב או חלקים מיישוב על קרקע שהיא בבעלות פלסטינית פרטית? אז כל יתר השאלות אינן רלוונטיות בכלל, כי גם החלטת הממשלה, על פי חוק, לא יכולה להיות להקים יישוב על קרקע פרטית. ויש יישובים לצערי שכולם, כולם, כל שטחם מצוי, ומאחזים בוודאי, שכל שטחם מצוי על קרקע פרטית פלסטינית. The issue where people are involved, the right of return and the right of settlers or the, or the illegality of settlers needs to be addressed head on. At the end of the day, Palestinians' rights are embedded in international law. Israeli illegal squatters on the West Bank uh, are no longer able to justify that, especially after the disengagement from the Gaza Strip. If Israeli settlers had any right under international law to be on Palestinian lands, do you honestly believe that Israel would have withdrawn unilaterally from the Gaza Strip? I think they're fully aware of the illegality of their presence in the West Bank, like the rest of the world has already acknowledged. And at the end of the day, those settlers will have to either be removed, hopefully peacefully, from the West Bank, or be incorporated under a state of Palestine, which to me is uh, also a potential, as long as they follow Palestinian law and remove, remove themselves from confiscated lands, some of those lands my family owns. I can live with Jews from Palestine, like us, but who come from overseas to take my home and kick me out, this is bad. I don't like to kill every Israeli. No, we don't have to do this. But for me, I want who's come from France, from America, go back to your country, from Germany. From... You see, this is a perspective that I think is fair. I, do, I disagree with my mother. Um, I think that whoever came, fine, stay. But stop. If you have a country, st stay there. Allow the Palestinians that were evicted to come back, and let's all stay together. Fine. My mom wants whoever came to go back. But she witnessed wars I didn't. Yes. OK? Yeah. Yani, uh, yani, I'm, I'm not asking people to leave, because there are second and third generation yeah, Israelis here. They have here. passport, another passport. They have uh, property there. They, they can go. I think what the Israelis are doing by building settlements in the West Bank, even they have more than 150 settlements in the West Bank, it's not going to work. Totally is not going to work. And they will destroy it like what they did in Gaza. There is no other solution. Don't play games. If you want to achieve peace, take it. Okay, don't break it. This kind of issues like settlements, it will break peace. להערכתי טוב נעשה אם ככל, ה... ככל שנקדים להתייחס ב... ביתר רצינות ל... ל... לקונפליקטים בין החוק הישראלי או הפעילות הישראלית לבין החוק הבינלאומי. I am 71 years old. I lived all my life with war. First one with uh, Britain, 
then with Israel. I'd never have peace, never. I went out to America, to went to live in America, but I like to come, I come homesick. I like my country. I came back. We come back here. We don't like any place in the world. We like our country. It is shame to come to your country? No. We were breastfed love of homeland. We never had a choice. But it also, I think it, it, um, it, it articulated also our, our humanity also. Really, it really, really did a lot to humanize us, to see the world as, as a cause, a cause, a just cause in anything we, we, we deal with, whether it, it be a political situation or an economic one or a social one. My mom was always very, Justice oriented. Everything had to be just, had to have rights. People yes, had to have their yes. rights. Too much. Too much. And I think also maybe because she witnessed the, the refugees when they were they fled from the nineteen forty eight. Eleven years old and I used to to cry, cry, cry with my mother. meeting a rather significant Israeli business person. And I was late to the meeting because one of the checkpoints on the way were, uh, delayed me. And when I got there, the first thing I said is I apologized and I told them why. And he was a little bit bent out of shape. He said, well, what do you expect? Uh, if we don't have these checkpoints, we'll have suicide bombers. How would you solve the issue? And I answered right back and said, the way I would solve the issue is that when you go to the cafe, I'm going with you and we're both sitting at that cafe together in Tel Aviv, I think that's the best security that you and I can have against either of our extremists blowing each of us up. Israelis made it and they're not good. They're dumb. They shoot people just like that. And once, once so many people died, and I think it was in Lebanon. just scare them. I would tell them, if you leave this wall, it would kill you. Well, I want to kill the Israelis. Why? Why? Because they shoot people just like this. Well, but I hate because they're, but I hate it because they can't go to prison. Why can't they go to prison? Because, I don't know. But I never heard something. Never saw, never heard about it as Ra'eli was in prison. It's the 23rd of December, and uh, I'm happy that I'm not leaving at 5 o'clock in the morning on my way back to Germany. But they only gave me three extra days, so it's on the 28th. Um, I guess in the end, you know, I'm, I'm happy to be with my family over Christmas, but we have no idea what's going to happen on the 28th. to extend my visa, which ends uh, right now, ends today, 12 o'clock, see if I can stay. So it's either they give me a visa or we get to go to the airport, see what happens. It's today, 28th. 
toward the clock. We're right on time. Bahla Fatma. I don't speak Hebrew. I need that paper. Is he saying that Gideon's not here? He told me to come at 12 o'clock today. I'm here at 12 o'clock. And now he's a no-show. So I said, no, I'm not going to leave. You're going to have to call. I said, yes, call him back. As I heard that he spoke Arabic, so I spoke to him in Arabic. It's like, why are you speaking to me in Hebrew? I speak Arabic. And also to this old man who was also Arab, obviously Arab. Yeah, Yoram, I'm here and Gideon is not here. They told me he's not here and that I had to go. So now they they finally came back with a paper where they scratched the date out, today's date out, and put the 4th of January. What, what, I, I have no idea and they're not letting me see anybody. What should I do? Yeah, I mean, this is ridiculous. They had you up here one time and now this, and now, it's just ridiculous. So, again, I get a wonderful piece of paper. And another week of hell. It's a total ignorance from the Israelis of what kind of a society there is here. I mean, you ask Israelis, they can't believe that uh, several hundred people would come and listen to a concert of Bach. There will not be a political solution so easily. If one could, if one could achieve trust, then the political solution would be easy. But how do you expect to have a political solution when there is total distrust and mistrust? And that's why I think it's important to really get down to the basics and to say, for instance, which is what I believe in, that there is no military solution to the conflict. The minute you say that, then a lot of things become meaningless, unnecessary, and useless. I live here alone. I don't have anybody here.